Psalm 5, 1 through 3, the psalmist says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayers unto thee and will look up. We are in Exodus chapter 2 in our Bibles, if you want to turn there, Exodus chapter 2. And this is sermon number 4 through a series I've titled, Leaving the Darkness. And the title of the message today is, God Hears Our Cry. God Hears Our Cry. Heard of a story, maybe you heard of this one too. Elderly couple who were in their old age, they noticed they were getting a lot more forgetful, so they decided to go to the doctor and get it checked out. The doctor told them that they should write things down so they don't forget. And so they went home, and the old lady told her husband to get her a bowl of ice cream, and she said, you might want to write it down. And he said, no, no, I can remember that you want a bowl of ice cream. Then she told her husband that she wanted a bowl of ice cream with whipped cream. Write it down. She told him again. He said, no, no. I can remember that. You want a bowl of ice cream with whipped cream. And the old lady said, well, I want a bowl of ice cream with whipped cream and a cherry on top. Write it down. Uh, He says, no, no, no. I got it. I got a bowl of ice cream, whipped cream with a cherry on top. So he goes to get the ice cream. He spends an unusual long time in the kitchen looking around. Over 30 minutes, he comes out to his wife and hands her a plate of eggs and bacon. The old wife stares at the plate for a moment and looks at her husband and asks, Where's the toast? (laughs) Yes. Do you ever wonder if your prayers are working? If your prayers work? You ever wonder if God is listening to you? Sometimes there's silence for a long time, huh? We pray and we pray and we pray and the door doesn't open. We wonder if it's ever going to open. Jesus would tell us to keep praying, keep seeking, keep knocking, and that door will be open. That parable, one of a neighbor coming next door and asking for some flour or for some sugar. And uh, the, the parable goes on to say that if the neighbor keeps on knocking persistently enough, that that neighbor who doesn't want to get them some flour will literally get up in the middle of the night and will give them what they ask. And Jesus compliments persistency in prayer. I remember an atheist buddy saying to me in high school, do you know that prayer only works 50% of the time? And they, really? He said, statistically, it only works 50% of the time. I said, you mean God can't say no? Doesn't he answer every time? God has three answers to your prayers. Yes, no, and wait. And sometimes it's hard to wait now, isn't it? But God has perfect timing. And today, the people, the Hebrews, we will see have been working for over 40 years since Moses has left Egypt, off into the land of Midian. They're in slavery, and they finally begin, the text says, to cry out to God. And this isn't like over a meal, God save us. Amen. Thanks for the food. Save us. Amen. This is not what happens. They start to beg God to save them. And he will hear them. And praise God, he has gone before them to prepare for them a savior. And I would propose to you today that even if you are not crying out to God today, but in five years or in 10 years from now, the moment in which you start crying out to God, that God has already prepared a savior and deliverer for you and for me, that he already has a plan in place. But it is interesting to watch the details of what it takes to come upon our lives to cause us to start crying out to God. That's the secret. That's where the magic is. For a broken and contrite spirit, this is what the Lord is pleased in. And if we just keep seeking him, keep asking him, keep crying out to him, you know what will happen? That door will open. Amen? 
In our text today, Exodus chapter 2, in our Bibles, we're going to read verses 16 to 25. Can we stand for the reading of God's Word? We always stand for the reading of God's Word to pay honor to Him. Remember whose word we're reading. Not my words. Oh, no. Not my opinions. Uh Uh-uh. Not my story. No, no. It belongs to Him. And so we stand in honor of Him, and we listen to His story and His words and allow it to impact our lives. Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 16, take a look. It says, Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came, uh, the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to give water to their father's flock to drink. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses rose up and saved them and gave water to their flock to drink. Then they came to Reuel, their father, and he said, Why have you come back so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he actually even drew the water for us and gave water to the flock to drink. And he said to his daughters, Well, where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Call to him so that I may eat bread, that he may eat bread. And Moses was willing to settle down with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and her name, and he named her, him Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now it happened in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the slavery, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God saw the sons of Israel, and God knew them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your story, and we see how our story aligns with it. And God, I ask today that you would align us with you, that we would see your goodness and grace once again in this story, that you would cause us to be a people who leave the darkness and run into your marvelous light day in and day out, that we would seek your face, that we would know you, and that you would be our Savior, our Deliverer over and over again. We come to you now. We ask you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You can be seated. If you're just joining us, last week we saw Moses take matters into his own hands. Do you remember? Taking matters into his own hands, seeing his Hebrew brothers suffering and one being beaten by an Egyptian slave driver, Moses struck him and killed him and buried him in the sand. Moses, just 40 years old, raised in the house of Pharaoh, thought it was time for him to become the savior of the Hebrews. It was boiling inside of him. He sees his people suppressed. He says, that's it. I'm going to go check out what's going on out there. He sees this slave driver beating one of his brothers, and he walks out there and kills the Egyptian master. But the next day when he went out to see his brothers again, the Hebrews working, he saw them fighting against each other. And Moses walks up to them and he rebukes one saying, why are you striking your brother? Why are you striking your brother? And they mocked him saying, do you think you are the savior and the judge of us? Newsflash, he was. But wrong time. Wrong timing. Will you kill us like you killed that Egyptian yesterday, they said? And then Moses was in fear. And he found out that he was a wanted man by his grandfather, Pharaoh. So he fled 250 miles away from Egypt to the land of Midian. And this is where our story picks up. Take a look at verse 15 in your text. Moses heard of this matter, so he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Okay, so after a long journey, 250 miles Uh, This is on the back side of the Red Sea on your maps. It's a long way. And he sits down next to a well because he's probably thirsty from his journey, needs to gather some water. And he sits down for a rest. Now, verse 16, take a look. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and filled the troughs to give water to their father's flock to drink. So Moses is sitting down at the well of Midian. And he sees seven ladies walk up 
to water their father's herd of sheep. Seven women at a well. Seven women all together where generally men would come to water, water their flocks. So a very interesting scenario. I mean, you're not going to see just seven women just walking around by the well often. And most like, what in the world's going on here? I just hit the jackpot. <clears throat> so there are seven ladies, sisters. Where are the men? Maybe the priest doesn't have any sons. So he's had all girls. But Moses just hit the jackpot and is now starring on The Bachelor. <laughs> Notice the father of these girls is the priest of Midian, the text says. Interesting detail, the priest of Midian. The Midianites are the descendants of Abraham and Keturah, Genesis 25 tells us. So they are in the family and the tribe of the Hebrews, even though they live in Midian. And this is the priest of the descendants of Abraham. And so he is the priest and or pastor of the town of Midian. And he's got seven daughters. And these gir girls were shepherdess. Now, weren't they? For he has no sons to take care of these sheep. And second, none of them are married. For if they were married, they would not be there taking care of these sheep. They would probably be off with their husband, and their husband would be taking care of those sheep. Female shepherds, cowgirls, herding these sheep around. Did they have camels? Did they have spurs? I don't know. Did they have cowboy boots on? Probably not. Maybe some leather sandals, that's for sure. But no doubt, they were herding around these sheep. Yes, just as cowboys do. Making sure these sheep had food and water. And Moses just so happens to take a water break by their well while they were coming to gather water for the sheep. And Moses locks eyes with one of them. Wow, who is that Midianite girl? She's gorgeous, he thought to himself. Moses was having one of those love at first sight moments, and look what happens, verse 17. Then the shepherds came and drove them, the ladies, away. And brothers, what did Moses do? Moses got up. The text says Moses rose up and saved them and gave water to their flock to drink. So some shepherds, these men, they came up while the girls were trying to get water for their flock, and the men pushed these girls out of the way and told them, leave the area. You don't belong here. And as they're yelling at the girls, telling them to leave, who knows, maybe pushing the sheep out of the area, the text says Moses rose up. Uh-oh. Now, men... You know what this means. When a man is sitting down and sees a problem going down and rises up, that means something is about to get handled. It is the scene in the saloon when someone is cheating at the poker table. The one man who isn't going to put up with it sits calmly, looks around. The blood starts to boil. The adrenaline starts to rush. He cracks his neck. The eye of the tiger shows up. He stands up at the table, stares at the man in the face cheating, and he flips the table in front of his face. And this is the moment the bar fight breaks out or the guns come out. But the man will not put up with the abuse. And Moses does this. Moses rose up and walked over to these shepherds and said, not today, boys. These women were here first. You can wait. And I'm going to water their flock for them. And you're going to wait over there. It says, but Moses rose up and saved them and gave water to their flock to drink. Now, something you would brush over very quickly. This is a great confrontation going on here. You don't just walk up to the local, uh, the local shepherds who get water here all the time and just tell them, hey, take a hike, bud. You got a problem, I got a problem with you. I love this. 
Moses is not going to put up with this. And brothers, we need more men in our society like this. Not passive. They see something wrong. They step in and make it right. We have let things like this happen way too much in our society. And that is why everyone is so scared and nervous to confront anyone doing wrong in our society. So those who are abused or those who abuse and are wicked, they just keep taking more ground because no one will stop them. No one will stand up to them. Not Moses. Notice the context. He is an outsider. He doesn't know this town or this well, and he is by himself. And he confronts, confronts the shepherds, plural, shepherds, plural in your text. That means multiple men. Most men in this day are like, I'm not stepping into that. I know the women are getting pushed around, but if I do something, I'll get beat up. And brothers, that is the difference. Between real men in that day and in this day, men are scared to get beat up. They are scared to get punched in the face. They're scared to go to war or battle. So they will watch on why women and children get abused in our society. And this is not okay. We are never to turn a blind eye to these things. Brothers, if that's you, you would rather run away than st and stand and watch while women and children get hurt. Maybe it's time you take a boxing class. Jiu-jitsu. Krav Maga. Get punched in the face a couple times so you aren't nervous to protect in our society. What has happened to our society that we are so passive as to not step in to stop evil in our town? This is crazy. I'm not going to get involved. What do people do? Pull out their phones. That's cute. Never go looking for a fight, but you should be ready to defend your family and the innocent in our society. Men are called to protect. And Moses definitely didn't need to get involved in this. Now, did he? It's not his town, not his well, not his context. He is an outsider. He is a sojourner just coming through town. Hey, I got no problem. I'm just going to carry on, act like nothing happened. Not Moses. For he is a deliverer. He is a savior. He is a protector. He is the type of Christ. Christ did not stand passive and just let us go to hell. He stepped in the gap. He fought the enemy face first, head on, and won. Brothers, are we going to leave it to our wives and run for the hills? That isn't popular in L.A. now, is it? This is, isn't, why, why does the room tighten when I talk about this? This shows us how far we are from this. For men for thousands of years would never put up with any of this stuff. It shows how far we are in our society. We are scared to step in at a grocery store and defend a woman and a child. Not my problem. I got to go. This is crazy. I'll never forget in Santa Monica when those old people were beat up on the street and left there. I'll never forget it. I could not believe my eyes. The people were just walking by letting this stuff go on and no one was stepping in to do anything. People see someone being robbed, they pull out their phones to record it. No one steps in. They would have recorded these women being pushed around by the shepherds, but not Moses. Moses was trained in physical combat, no doubt, for he grew up under Pharaoh as his grandfather and would have to be able to lead the military one day. Second, we know Moses was trained because he was able to kill an Egyptian slave driver who was no doubt strong and ready to fight anybody who came into his face. And Moses took the risk to kill this man. He is not nervous. He's not scared. He is not fearful. He gets after it. We have to make decisions to be these men if we want to see evil stopped in our society. Men not speaking up so as to not disrupt anyone is what has gotten us to this place. Brothers, we need to get comfortable with making people feel uncomfortable if they are promoting evil in our town. You promote evil, I'm going to make you uncomfortable every time. I will not allow you to do that. I don't care where I'm at. In the grocery store, I'm at the gym, I'm at the bank. You're not going to act like that in our town. We don't stand for that. You can go somewhere else if you want to, but that is not okay. Evil is not allowed here. 
It has corroded into everything because we do not make a stand. Moses did it and it won him, watch this, the hand of a beautiful bride as we will see. Women want protectors, brothers. Women want providers, brothers. Women want a man who will lead their family well, become those men, and get working on it. C.S. Lewis wrote this in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Even C.S. Lewis, the writer, got it right. Battles are ugly when women fight. Societies that send their women off to war are even uglier. Let it not be us. Are you okay? Did it, do you want to flip a table? Did it get the blood boiling? I like to have fun. I like to have a blast and enjoy life and party all the time. I really do. And I like to be dead serious about these things. There's no way are we going to let people just run over our families in this town and take them off into the world and destroy them. We're not going to let it happen. We must start standing for righteousness. You don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to be mean. But you should speak up and say something. Verse 18, then they came to Ruel, their father, or this is Jethro, some of you Bible students know. And he said, why have you come back so soon today to his daughters? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he actually even drew water for us and gave water to the flock to drink. He got water for us and for the sheep. Their father's like, what are you girls doing back so early? Say, you never believe it, dad. This Egyptian guy showed up in town and he delivered us from the shepherds who push us around every week. Not only did he protect us and confront those shepherds, he drew water out of the well and gave water to the whole flock. And that's why we are back so early. The girls were so excited. I want to add this, brothers. These guys who are running into evil and living in evil and promoting evil and abusing, if you stand to them, they will run. They're very, very fearful and scared. It doesn't take much. All you have to say is say, hey, stop that. And everything changes. They're so nervous. All they need is someone to stop them, just to say something, and it stops everything. But because we say nothing, we're nervous to disrupt and cause problems with people, make someone uncomfortable. Oh, no, this is how we've got here. These girls were so excited to tell their dad, there's this guy. He took care of us. He stood up against those bullies. He struck them down. And that's why we're back early. Look at this picture. No doubt God was preparing the man, Moses, to protect the Hebrews, the Israelites, from the hand of Pharaoh as he would lead them out of Egypt in great danger through the Red Sea. What kind of man do you need to do that? A passive man could not do this. We need bold, fierce, focused, unwavering, standing firm, confronting kind of man. Ladies, raise your boys to be this way. Let them stand in the face of danger. Let them take risks. Let them grow in these things. Very important. Instruct them in boldness. Of course, make them kind and gentle if you can. We want that demeanor of Jesus upon them, but we want the fierce carpenter and the warrior at the cross as well. We need men of valor. I've had the chance to hang out with some great men in the last few months, men behind the scenes of our world, fighting evil, saving women and children who have been sold into sex slavery. They are Navy SEALs. They are commanders of the Navy SEALs. And just fierce trained men who are running into the darkest places on the earth to save these women and children. I was with them last night. They are bold and fierce, will not back down to anything. They run into the fire, but they are very hospitable, gentle, and the kindness of Christ shines through them. And they are motivated by the love of Jesus to expose all the darkness and save the innocent. And praise God, there are brothers also who support them. Big money guys involved funding all of this, putting their necks on the line with their finances to see darkness put to death. We are in a real spiritual war, and we all must play a part. 
It's crazy to come in contact with the people who are actually going in to save these women and children. They're actually in there doing the deed that none of us will do. There is a real spiritual battle going on in this world, and I know we got great lattes. I like them too, and I like my shoes. It's very comfortable, and the air conditioning and the heater is nice. But there is real evil going on in our city, in our world, and we can't just bury our heads in the sand over and over. We don't need to be alarmist either. We don't need to uh, run around saying the sky is falling. That's not helpful either. We can stay calm and collected and focused and keep chipping away standing for what is right wherever we go, and let the light just penetrate the darkness everywhere. This is what we must do. Men, women, and children, we must all do this together. Listen to the prayer of the psalmist King David. You haven't read this one in a long time, I guarantee it. Psalm chapter 144, verse 1. Praise the Lord who is my rock. He trains my hands for war. He gives my fingers skill for battle. For it was David with the slingshot. He is my loving ally and my fortress, my, t my tower of safety, my rescuer. He is my shield. I take refuge in him. He makes the nation submit to me, David says. He trains my hands for war, my fingers for skilled battle. God was preparing Moses, training his hands to stand up to the greatest evil on the planet, the most powerful nation and king, the king of Egypt. Moses would lead the people with protection and provision. He would bring his people, his sheep, water. He'd do it in the desert. He'll protect them from the enemy and he'll bring them water. Exactly what he does here at the well. It's a beautiful picture parallel. It says the daughters tell their dad what happened in verse 20. He said to his daughters, well, where is he then? Why is it that you have left behind this man, call to him, so that he may eat bread? The dad is like, did you get his name, girls? Anybody know his name? Um, no. Are you kidding me? Find him. Get him here. Let's make dinner for him. Jethro is thinking, is there a good man in town? A stranger who protects and cares for the flock of my girls? Where is he? He's husband material. Brothers, all you need to do to figure out what kind of man you need to become to find a great girl is you need to think of yourself in the future of being a dad who has a daughter. And if you have your baby girl, your daughter, who do you want her to marry? That is the man you should become. That's it. It's that simple. Jethro was looking for a husband for one of his daughters, and look what happens. The bachelor. Someone gives out a rose. Verse 21. Take a look. Come on, LA. Come on. Studio City. Come on. I know you watch it. Some of you watching that Golden Bachelor, aren't you? I know you are. Verse 21, and Moses was willing to settle down with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Mo Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. He names the boy after his journey. I was a foreigner in Le Egypt, and now I am finally at home with my people. Moses gets married. Fun. Be fun to go to Moses' marriage, uh, wedding, huh? See his marriage ceremony. God had a plan to bring Moses into the desert to find a wife. He was fleeing from Pharaoh after a bad decision as he killed that Egyptian. But God remembered the situation by bringing Moses a wife named Zipporah and giving him a son named Gershom. There's nothing so anchoring of a man's soul as to find a wife and have a child. It will help straighten a man up quickly, that's for sure. I like this picture. Men are like trucks. Trucks. If the bed of the truck is empty, it's easier. That truck swerves around on the road. It, it can swerve back and forth a lot easier. But if you load up the back of the truck and you weigh it down, the straighter it will drive. Men need the burden of responsibility on them as to not wander. Brothers, the lighter your load, the more you're wandering in life. You're all over the map. The more responsibility on your back, you take on a wife, you take on kids, you take on a family, you take on work, you take on a business, you take on 
you will drive straighter. We're built that way. You get freedom, do whatever you want, sloppy, all over the map. Trust me, I was there. Picture me with long, crazy hair. Go ahead, use your imagination. <laughs> Beautiful, long mane with a big beard, running around. Sloppy kid. Men and women will grow more as people in marriage and having children than any other time in life. It's fertilizer. You're forced into a mold quickly. And you can either just become darker and more angry and more sinful, or you're going to become more like Christ. God's preparing Moses. He is now a husband, a father, and a shepherd. How do you think that will lead in, bleed into his leading? Look at verse 23. Now it happened in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. And the sons of Israel sighed because of slavery and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery rose up to God. The author of this book, Exodus, Moses, backs out on the story. He gives you a big wide lens shot of the story. Gives us a God view perspective. Moses' grandfather Pharaoh has died. Yes, the one who sought to kill him. Almost 40 years have passed in our story. The beginning of chapter 3 shows God coming to Moses to talk with him in the form of a burning bush, which we'll look at next week. But the people of Israel have been working day and night in slavery for the last 40 years, and they start to cry out to the Lord. They cry out for help, freedom from this slavery, and Moses writes down that the Lord hears their cries. Psalm 5, 1 through 3, the psalmist says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayers unto thee and will look up. The psalmist says, Hearken unto the voice of my cry. The word hearken is, is like when a deer is walking through the forest and hears a branch snap. The ear goes up. This is the hearkening unto the voice of my cry. Please, God, turn your ear to me. Please listen to my cries. It says, O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayers unto thee and will look up. He will Hear the voice of our cry, our King, and our God. Psalm 34, 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all of my fears. Isaiah 40, 31 says that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and they will not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. Who? Those who wait upon the Lord. That's the key. That's the secret. We must go to him in prayer. We must wait upon him. We must cry out to him. And that is when he hears. He hearkens unto our cry and he shows up in our situation. Look at verse 24 and 25. So God hearing their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God knew them, the text says. God knew them. I love this. He knew them. He knew them well. Psalm 103, verse 13. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He knows he knows, he knows, he knows our frame. He knows who we are. He knew the children of Israel. The text says, he knows us. He knows our frame. He has compassion on us. He remembers that we are dust. He's made us. A couple things as we close. Number one, the Lord hears us. Have you been crying to the Lord? He hears you. And he will meet you. 
God says, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart, God hears you. Yeah, but he's not showing up now. I know. Why isn't he answered yet? I know. He lets us wait sometimes, doesn't he? But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. He's working something in you. He knows your frame. He knows you can't handle it. He knows it's too much. He is the deliverer. He hears your cry, and he will save you. Not only does he hear us, not only does he hear our prayers, the Lord remembers us, praise God. He has compassion on us as a father has compassion for his kids. You know, sometimes my kids do things and I get all, you know, angry. I'll get all mad about something. I'll be looking at them. And then I remember, they're just kids. They're just babies trying to figure it out. Look at how long it's taken me to figure it out. And I still throw tantrums sometimes. You, pastor? Yeah. Talk to my wife. I remember their frame. I know who they are. They're just babies trying to figure it out. And I have compassion. And if I can have compassion as an earthly father, how much more does my heavenly father have compassion when he looks at me? He knows how much I can carry. He remembers us. He has compassion on us. Isaiah 49, 14. Yet my people say, the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. The Lord says, never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, God says, I will not forget you. He says, behold, I have inscribed your name on the palms of my hands. I will never forget you. I will never leave you. Never forsake you. He knows our frame that we are dust. For he has made us, he will take care of us, he will sustain us. Moses, the deliverer in this text, points to the great deliverer, the Lord Jesus. Church, who is actively praying for you, interceding for you as we speak. Does God hear me? Yes. Is God hearing my cries? He is. Does God have a deliverer on the way, a savior on the way? He does. He's gone before you. It's already on its way. The Red Sea will part. It will all work out. We must lift it into his hands. The Lord Jesus has pulled us out of darkness into his marvelous light, who stood in the gap, fought the enemy, and defeated him on the cross to bring salvation and forgive, forgiveness to us. He set us free from the bondage and slavery of sin in this world. He is the one leading us out of Egypt, out of the world, into his kingdom, into Christ. The command today, once again, is to leave the darkness. Leave the darkness of your life. Leave the darkness of the sin. Whatever happened yesterday, whatever has happened this week, get out of the darkness. Follow after the Savior. He is ready to save. Call upon the Lord again to save you now. God is our shepherd, and he will carry us through. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. I want to close in this. Psalm 95, verse 6 and 7, it says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. He's leading and guiding you. He hears the cries of his sheep, and he will bring them water. He will protect them. He will make you lie down in green pastures. He will give you rest. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And God, I pray that you would save us from ourselves. That you would save us from this world, that you would call us out of darkness into your marvelous light once again. You are the good shepherd, protecting providing, taking care of us. And Lord, we thank you that you hear our cries. And I don't know what burdens your people are carrying today, but God, you know. And I pray now, while we're praying, church, 
Would you lift those burdens into the hand of God? He tells you, Jesus says, cast your burden upon me and I will give you rest. Maybe it feels like slavery. Maybe it feels like bondage, sin, whatever it is trying to plague you and tear you down. Lord, we lift these things. We open our hands to you and we lift these burdens into your hands. And we cry out to you in this moment and just say, please, God, save us. Save us from the darkness around us. Save us from this world. Save us from our own sin that keeps trying to tear things down. We need your help. We can't do it without you. You are the deliverer. We cry out to our God, save this city. Save this place. Save our homes. The oppression is great. The darkness is great. Father, please save us from this evil generation. And God, we pray that you would raise up many Moses, many men and women that will stand in the gap for your glory. Use us, Father, in this town to bring many to come to know you. And as we shine the light into this dark place, we pray that it would flee, that your glory would be known. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.